All right, it is good to see you here this morning. Help me welcome those who are at Lakeside watching us there. Welcome those who are online. It is awesome that you're here today. You know, this really, we started the year saying this was the year that we were to, we were going to look at what if this was the year we were free. And we talked about some things. We talked about free of that sin that's had a hold of us. And we're walking through the, the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, and Paul is talking about how to have victory and freedom over sin in our lives. But we also said, what if this is the year we got financially free or on the road to financial freedom? And so for the last couple of weeks, we've had our um, financial peace classes that have, have been meeting and starting down that journey of finding financial freedom. And so today, I want to give you a snapshot of what we've learned so far and why we really did this and why we thought it was so important. We have about 400 adults going through financial peace right now, which is incredible. And let's say that 20, let's say that we're the average of the country and 20% of those people are debt free. So that means we have about 320 people who are going through uh, financial peace that uh, have debt. Well, I want to reveal to you what our debt is for those going through financial peace. And so if you look up here, uh, it's more than two cents, I mean, more than $50, all right? It's going to keep going up. And, and this is just non-mortgage debt. So this is credit card. This is, there we go. 500, actually I've gotten some more in and we're at $5,986,853. And that is non-mortgage debt. So what you're looking at, all the way to five, there we go. What you're looking at is credit card debt, um, student loan debt, and car loan debt. Primarily, those are the three debts that are up there. With 300, I mean, 320 adults, which means that the average adult with debt in our church, non-mortgage debt, is over $18,700 per person that's going through this. Uh, and, and just a little bit more to that, let's say that of that $6 million, that we're paying an average of 12% interest. Because we know credit cards, 18 to 29% interest, but we also know that student loan and car loans can probably be lower than that. So let's just average it at 18% interest. That means that as a church, these, that, that we are paying over $720,000 a year in interest alone, non-mortgage interest alone, over $720,000 a year. Now, let me ask you this. What could happen for the kingdom with $720,000? Yesterday, we packed 200,000 meals at the Pines and had a great experience as we had hundreds of people show up and we packed 200,000 meals. Do you know that if we just paid off our debt, didn't change our lifestyle, and gave that money to Burundi that we could pack 3 million meals for Burundi? Uh, think about the mission trips that we could take for $720,000. How many people around the globe could hear the gospel? Think about the homeless shelter and the ministry that could happen with $720,000. But I want to give you even, I want to give you the bright side of this number. Because we're here, because we're eating the elephant, because we're learning biblical stewardship when it comes to our finances, here's what I know that we're going to have healthier marriages and less divorce because there's going to be a lot less fighting in the home over finances when we learn how to follow biblical stewardship. We're going to sleep better, <laughs> that you're not going to have to worry about where the, the payment, car payment's coming next month when you learn to live with biblical stewardship. Young couples are going to start out their lives on a more firm foundation because they're not going to start off their lives with $100,000 worth of student loan debt that, that's going to be on them. And, and here's what we know. There's going to be a decrease in materialism and an increase in joy, and that's what we want for you. 
And so we've, we're starting out with almost $6 million worth of debt and 839 credit cards in those 320 people. And so what we're doing is we're showing you this snapshot because you're going to be amazed at what it looks like in about six weeks, seven weeks, when we have our second reveal. So I want to pray for all of us, and then we're going to jump into Romans chapter 8. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it leads us in truth and in all areas of our lives, but God, also in the area of our stewardship and our finances. I thank you for those who are walking through this study, and I thank you ahead of time for all the ways you're going to work and bring freedom in so many lives. And God, help us as we look at your word and guide us in it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My first exposure to Coe wasn't the town up the road. Years ago, when I was a student minister, I took a student group to Ridgecrest, North Carolina, and on the way back, we went rafting down the Ocoee River in Tennessee. Anybody ever done that, right? The Ocoee River in Tennessee, it's, it's a, a river right on the Cherokee National Forest, and the water is controlled by a dam. And so they have certain days when they release the water, and you go whitewater rafting. It's got class three, class four whitewater with, uh, with names like Broken Nose, Table Saw, Diamond Splitter, and Slam Dunk, all right? And, and so I'm taking my student group, and, and this was one day the water was running really good, and we're driving up to the outfitters, and as we're driving, all of the, the whitewater's to the right, and some of our kids decided that they just weren't going to do it, but we loaded up in about four or five rafts, got outfitted, got our, you know, our paddles and our all, and you get in there, and your guide is in there, and your guide up at the top, it's in real calm water, he starts to give you certain direction. You know, here's, when I say this, I want you to paddle this way, and, and, and here's what I want you to do here, and, and there's going to be some places where it's kind of calm. I'll tell you, you can jump out and just kind of float, and there's other times I'm going to tell you, hold on for dear life, right? And so he, he does all of his training, and our, our float, you know, our rafts start going down, and I'm in the very last raft, and I can remember why watching the first raft go through the first really good white water. I mean, those kids were screaming and yelling and, and holding on, and they get to the bottom, and it's calm again, and they're just celebrating like nobody's business. Man, the next raft does it and all. Well, then the raft in front of me, man, they hit that white water, and the first jump, I mean, the first boom that they hit, man, somebody fell out. And I go, oh, I'm interested. And then I realized it was the guide who fell out. And I'm going, oh, Lord, how am I going to explain to these parents, 10 of your kids didn't come home with me, all right? And, and all, I mean, it was just, I'm freaking out. I'm in the last raft. Well, he's trying to swim back to the raft. There's no way with all of the water. And they finally get to calm water, and he swims over, gets into the raft. And from that point on, you know, we don't have any incidents. But, but for a while there, it was incredibly scary. Uh, but as long as the guide was in the raft, I didn't panic. And we had a great time. The guide was constantly working, giving warnings, telling us what to do, how to paddle, saying, look, there's nothing, you know, no danger for the next mile, so hop out and, and enjoy a float. And, and even when the kids were paddling, the truth is the guide was doing most of the work at that time. But here's what I want us to understand is that today Paul is going to tell us that you need a guide for your life. You need someone in the boat instructing you, warning you, preparing you. And the Bible tells us that as believers, God has given us a guide. In your notes, the Holy Spirit is your guide. Look at what Jesus said in John 16, 13. Jesus said, but when he, the Spirit of truth, talking about the Holy Spirit, when, the, when he comes, he will what? Oh, that was weak. Come on, help me here. Those at Lakeside, help me again. He will what? He will guide you. You may want to circle that. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you, he will tell you what is to come. And so here's what Jesus is saying, that you have a guide. You, if you're a Christian, there is a guide in the boat with you, and he is there to direct you and to lead you and to let you know when trouble is coming and let you know when it's safe and, and tell you how to maneuver. And the truth is, even when we're doing all we can, the truth is he's doing most of the work. 
and he is working within us. And and so Jesus is teaching us that the Holy Spirit would be given to us as a guide to instruct us in many different ways through his word, through prayer, through solitude, through others, through the church, on how to live the victorious Christian life. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit 19 times in this chapter. He's so wanting to drive home that if you want the victorious life, it is found in the Holy Spirit's power within you. As we're walking through this uh, chapter, we started in verses 1 through 4, basically say this. There, it is impossible for you to live a victorious life on your own. You need help, and that help is the Holy Spirit. In other words, you need a guide in the boat with you, and that is the Holy Spirit. In verses 5 through 11 that we looked at last week, what Paul was basically saying, the guide does you no good if you don't listen to the guide. You've got to learn to listen to the guide as he directs us uh, and tells us what to do. And today what we're going to look at is once I know I have a guide in the boat, once I know I'm a, a believer... And once I, I hear the guide, I, let the, I set my mind on the Spirit and let the Spirit lead. Paul's going to say today, now you've got to do what the guide says. You've got to let the Holy Spirit lead you. In fact, in your notes, you've got to let the Spirit guide you. You need to understand that just as the guide in the boat is the one who directs and protects and leads, that's what the Holy Spirit is going to do in your life if you set your mind on the Spirit. Paul has already said, you've got a choice. You can set your mind on on the things of the flesh or set your mind on the Spirit. And if you set your mind on the Spirit, then the Spirit will lead us and guide us to that victorious life. You know, there's a bumper sticker I see every once in a while, and it, it's just, it's this one. God is my co-pilot. God is my co-pilot. Do you understand how terrible that theology is? Right? God is not your co-pilot. God is your what? Pilot, because you don't know where you're going, right? I mean, you need the guide. You need the pilot to direct you, and that pilot is the Holy Spirit. So how does the Holy Spirit want to lead us? In your notes, several, several things. First of all, the Holy Spirit will guide you to put to death the deeds of the flesh. One of the ways you know the Holy Spirit is in you is that he will lead you to desire to put away the deeds of the flesh. Look at Romans 12, 8, 12, and 13. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if we live according to the sinful nature, we will die. But if if by the Spirit we put to death the misdeeds of the body, then you will live. Remember, we talked about there are three laws that are at effect in our lives. There's the law of God, his word, and the truth that we find in God's God's word, how he wants us to live, the standard for our lives. Then there's the law of the flesh or the law of the body or the law of sin. And it's our fallen sinful nature. And and, uh, it is in direct contradiction to God's law. And so they're at war together. But then there's a third law that's been introduced after the cross, and that is the law of the Holy Spirit. And it is the Spirit that comes in as our guide to empower us. And one of the things he will do is he will empower you to put to death daily, and by the way, it has to be daily, the deeds of the flesh or the pull of the flesh, and the only way you can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do we activate that power in our lives? Well, look at Galatians 5, 16 and 17 in your notes. Here's what Paul said in Galatians. He said, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Paul is saying, you have got to to listen to the Spirit and let him lead you. And one of the things the Spirit's going to do is to lead you to have victory over the sinful nature. Um, Live by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want to do. Here's what you need to understand. There is a holy war going on inside of every believer. 
And every day the war is based on this. Who's going to lead me today? The flesh or the spirit? How do I determine if the flesh leads me or the spirit leads me? Well, Paul said, it depends on what you set your mind on. If I wake up today and I seek the Spirit and I surrender to the Spirit and I say, God, lead me today, the Spirit will lead me and I can have victory over the flesh and over sin. But if I wake up today and say, well, now what am I going to do for myself today? Then, then I will not have victory. It all depends on where we set our minds. Now, look, we can quote verses like, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Or we are more than conquerors through him who is in Christ Jesus. Those are all true, but it doesn't mean it's easy. It's a daily battle that we go through. In fact, I wanted to show you again. Last week, we looked at this. Paul lists some of the acts of the sinful nature there in Galatians 5, starting verse 19. And he's wanting us to know, man, here's examples of what it looks like when, by this, when you, you seek after the things of the flesh. And you can look at that list and, uh, in 19, uh, chapter 5, verse 19. And he says, here are some of those, man, impurity, idolatry, idolatry hatred, jealousy, rage, ambition, um, dissensions, factions. He goes on and on. And he says, these are some of what it looks like if you're living by the flesh. But here's what I want you to see in all of those things, what they have in common. Every one of those is about me. I'm upset at you, so I'm going to be angry at you. Or I'm selfish, or, or I uh, am envious, or I need to find some way to deaden this pain, so I'm drinking to do that. Or, or I have impure thoughts. Every one of those has to do with the flesh that's leading and that's in charge. And Paul is saying, when the Holy Spirit is in you, he will lead you to overcome the pull of the flesh so that you will desire the things that the Spirit desires for you. The second thing the Holy Spirit is going to do is he's going to guide you. And before we look at those two things, I want us to look at verse 14. He goes on to say that you will put to death the misdeeds of the body and you will live because those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. That word led there is a picture word of an animal who allows a bridle to be put in him so that somebody can take the reins and lead that animal. And so understand what Paul is saying here. He is saying that that here's what it means to be led by the Spirit. It means to say, Spirit, I give you the reins of my life, and you lead me, and I will follow you where you lead me. That's what it means for the Spirit to lead us, just basically to say, God, I give you the reins of my life. You're in control. You're, You're leading me. Now, here's what we know, that, that a large horse, you can put a bit in his mouth and reins, and if that horse has been broken, that horse will allow you to lead him. Saturday, one Saturday morning during the Olympics, I was just flipping through, and they had uh, horse jumping. Uh, you know, this was on one of the other stations, and I'm watching for a little while. It's amazing how this rider can take this horse, and, and this horse will, will follow its commands and jump over all of these, you know, um, obstacles and and uh, and so and it was something to watch. You know, just every once in a while, a horse might hit a railing; they'd be deducted. But it was amazing to watch that. But it reminded me of a YouTube video somebody sent me one time of horse jumping, and there was. There was this horse, and this guy's riding, and man, this horse is going to town and everything, and, and this horse gets up to this big jump with water on the other side of it. Horse goes, and the rider's getting ready for him to jump, and the horse said, not today. You know, horse just stopped. I mean, just, you know, just, just stopped. That rider went over the top of that horse, did about three flips, and hit the water. I mean, the only reason I can laugh about it is the rider got up and walked away, so he didn't die. But here's, here's the thing. Here's what we know. There's no way that that rider could make the horse do something the horse didn't want to do. See, the horse had to be willing to be led. But if the horse wasn't willing, if the horse said, not today, there was no way that that rider was going to make the horse do that. Here's the same thing. God has given us a free will. And there are some days we wake up and we say, not today. And it's on those days that that we're in the most trouble. You see, what Paul is saying here, to be led by the Spirit means to say daily, God, yes, today I give you the reins. 
Today, I willfully follow you. Today, wherever you lead, I'll go. Where we get in trouble many times is we'll say things like this. God, I'll give you everything in my life except my money. I'll give you everything in my life except my weekends. I'll give you everything in my life except my work. Or I'll give you everything in my life except for this secret sin over here. And, and here's what we need to understand. Man, the, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit must lead us, and that means all of us, in every area of our lives. And let me tell you, it's not always going to be easy. And sometimes it's going to seem counterintuitive, like, man, if it's God, is this really what you want me to do? Because it's a lot easier path over here, right? Why this? Understand this. The Holy Spirit, the Bible said, led Jesus to the cross, and he willfully followed. The Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and, and to fast, and, and Jesus willfully followed. His leading isn't always going to feel good, but it's always the best. It's always the best for us. It's always going to produce the best in us, and we need to allow him to lead us daily. Well, what will he lead us to do? Two things as we close. He will lead you, first of all, to walk in gratitude. Back to verse 12, Paul said, Now, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. Now, that word obligation, probably a, a, another good translation is we have an indebtedness. We, are, we have an indebtedness. And Paul says, and by the way, the obligation or the indebtedness is not to live according to the flesh, but it's to live according to the spirit. Now, there's two kinds of debt. There's the kind of debt that we're dealing with in financial peace. It's where we have promised more than we have, so now we got to make it up somehow, right? And, and so we owe more than we have, and, and we have a debt that we have to pay. We're obligated to pay. That's one kind of debt. But there's also another kind of indebtedness. Let's say that I'm out of town. I'm at a restaurant. Something gets caught in my throat, and I'm choking. And I am close to passing out. I'm turning blue already. I am about to die. And everybody's standing around looking at me, except one guy finally jumps up, comes, gives me the Heimlich. My airway clears. I'm going to live now. I am indebted to that guy. Let's say we trade information, you know, phone numbers and all, because I want to write him and thank him. He wants to check up on me. What if he called me up about three months later? He said, Chuck, my daughter's down there in Orlando. She's going to Disney World. Her car broke has a flat. It's kind of close to the church. Do you think you could go over and help her fix her tire? What if I said not a chance? Right? Would I, I wouldn't say not a chance. What would I say? Absolutely. Why? Because I am indebted to this guy because he saved my life. Well, understand this. That's the kind of indebtedness that Paul's talking about. When you understand what God has done for you, if you understand the cross and what that means for you, when you understand salvation by grace alone, through, by faith alone, through grace alone, see, then allowing the Spirit to lead us isn't something we have to do. It's something we want to do because we know this indebtedness. And then secondly, he will lead you to walk in confidence. Romans 8, 15. But you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a, a spirit of sonship, and, we, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We can walk in confidence because we've been adopted into uh, God's family. By the way, Paul is using a word here that's used in Roman adoption. And in Rome, if you were adopted, you couldn't be unadopted. I mean, it was for a lifetime. And Paul is saying, you've been adopted into God's family. His power is available to you. We looked at this last week, that same power that rose Christ from the dead. The Spirit has that power in you, and he's going to lead you. There's how that last verse here in John. You, dear children, so we're adopted into this family. We're a child of God. You, dear children, uh, are from God and have overcome them. Here he's talking about false spirits. It says, because the one who is in you is, he, is greater than the one who is in the world. Scripture is teaching you have the power through the Holy Spirit to live in freedom, to live in confidence, to live with gratitude, and to put to death the deeds of the flesh so you can truly live the life abundant.